Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome to this uh, webinar where we're absolutely delighted that we have two very high caliber people in conversation. First, uh, Kevin Rudd is in Australia and then George Robertson is here in Scotland. <clears throat> By way of background, uh, George Robertson was the, as Lord Robertson, was the 10th Secretary General of, the, of NATO between 1999-2004. He served as UK Defence Secretary and he is Special Advisor to BP PLC and Chairman of BP Russia Investments Committee. He was Shadow Secretary of State for Scotland from 1993 to 1997 and served as Vice Chairman of the British Council from 1985 to 1994. He has held and continues to hold many significant board appointments. And we are absolutely delighted that he's going to lead this conversation with uh, the Honourable Kevin Rudd, who served as Australia's 26th Prime Minister and as Foreign Minister. He led Australia's response during the global financial crisis, the only major developed economy not to go into recession, and helped found the G20. Kevin Rudd joined the Asia Society Policy Institute in New York as its inaugural president in January 2015. And in the same year, he started to lead a review of the UN system as chair of the Independent Commission on Multilateralism. He's chair of the board of the International Peace Institute and is involved with a number of other uh, activities. But above all, from Australia, he is a great expert on the events unravelling in China at the moment. And I'm delighted that he has agreed to answer the questions and, and be in conversation with George Robertson, to whom I now have pleasure in handing over. Thanks, Roddy. Uh, when, when introductions take up most of the time of a, of a, a webinar or a seminar, you begin to realise, you know, that uh, you're, you're getting your obituaries before you die. Anyway, I, it's good to talk to uh, a fellow uh, former politician, <laughs> especially uh, from the rough house of Australian politics, which is just like uh, like Scottish politics, but just slightly less polite uh, than even we are at the moment. So, Kevin, I wanted to start off in seven days time. Um, Donald Trump is facing uh, the electorate and uh, clearly um, it has major repercussions for the for the whole world. What is the outcome? Uh, probably in eight days' time. So, who do you think is going to win? Uh, why do you think uh, he's going to win? Uh, and what do you think it's going to do for the world? Well, thanks, George and Roddy, and good to talk to uh, all of our good friends in Scotland. I've uh, been to Scotland many times over the years, um, Edinburgh, Glasgow, and elsewhere. My wife claims uh, Scottish ancestry from the Isle of Skye. Uh, I, however, am purely English criminal class, exported to Australia in the 1790s. Uh, she brings Scottish finesse to our union. I bring basic Australian criminality. Uh, to answer your question, uh, George, uh, one, I think uh, Biden will win. And uh, that's not some uh, crude intuition on my part. I've spent uh, most of the last uh, several days speaking to uh, American political analysts who I've learned to trust over many, many years. And the, it is a remarkable consensus among them. Um, and particularly when you see Obama campaigning in the way in which he's been in Florida, you see the competitiveness of the race in Texas. Um, and given that um, uh, Biden needs to win neither of those in order to win. And so uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, where it stands right now. Uh, and also the background briefing by Republicans that they are in grave danger of losing significantly in the Senate, uh, as well, of course, in the House. Secondly, uh, why? I think there's one uh, answer to that, and it's kind of the lap of the gods. Uh, it's uh, COVID-19 um, and the failure of the United States to manage the crisis uh, uh, in um, public health policy terms, uh, stripping bare, if you like, uh, the uh, raw sinews of a public health system in the United States, uh, which uh, is dysfunctional at the best of times and particularly dysfunctional at a time of crisis. 
Um, and the level of uh, COVID uh, denialism by the US president um, has, I think, even rubbed his own constituency up the wrong way. And as a consequence, uh, it has undermined his credibility personally. But more fundamentally, George, as you know, in politics, the economy, while not being everything, is almost everything. Um, and having presided over uh, the biggest bull market run in American history through until January, February of this year, to then be presiding over something uh, which is uh, the worst economic crisis uh, since the depression uh, with double digit unemployment and the rest uh, and with uh, no real light at the end of the tunnel means that his core strength for being reelected has been cut from under him. And then on the question of COVID, his core liability has been exposed uh, in terms of the essential importance of the public social infrastructure of the nation. Thirdly, what's it mean uh, for all of us as uh, friends, partners and allies of the United States? If Biden wins, I believe his um, uh, first instinct, and I, like yourself, George, spend a fair bit of time when we're able to travel in Washington and New York. In fact, I normally work in New York. Um, and knowing the senior members of uh, Biden's team who are responsible for foreign and security policy uh, and, um, and uh, defense policy and trade, I think the first instincts uh, of Biden will be to uh, bind up the wounds which have been inflicted on America's alliance structures around the world, both in Europe and in Asia. Essentially, um, what uh, we've had with uh, the Trump presidency has been uh, a disparagement of um, traditional uh, US alliances around the world the selection of a couple of personalities with whom uh, he can uh, uh, extract uh, levels of comfort and support from. Uh, Boris Johnson, to some extent, primarily Shinzo Abe, to some extent, the Australian Prime Minister Morrison. But the rest of the allies basically uh, scoring one level of opprobrium after another uh, from Trump during the presidency. And George, you and I know alliance politics, you've been uh, the head of NATO, you know how these things work. It's quite remarkable to have the level of uh, public vituperation from the United States president against so many allies, whether it's Germany, whether it's against France, the European Union and others, and in Asia, um, South Koreans, not to mention others. Uh, and it's just uh, frankly has stretched the fabric almost to breaking point at various places. So to answer your question and not to elaborate further on I'll go on too long in the answer, George. I think his first instinct will be to repair the alliance structures. I think I think that's right. But will we actually see a huge difference? Um, you know, after all, you know what Trump's rhetoric has been uh, has been pretty pretty vile uh, at times. You know, certainly extreme. But on the other hand, he's essentially con continued with the uh, the Obama foreign policy, generally speaking. So are we going to see anything really dramatic happening or is it just going to be, as you say, binding of the wounds? Well, in terms of continuity and change in US foreign policy, it really does depend on um, uh, the theatre we're talking about. Here in East Asia, the dynamics have changed fundamentally uh, between Obama and Trump around the central organising principle of China. Uh, the Obama administration, while robust in its dealings with China, the pivot to Asia, stationing of American Marines in Darwin in my own country, I facilitated that agreement as a Labor Prime Minister um, and as Foreign Minister. Um, and then uh, Trump, however, taking that robust, uh, shall we say, US relationship with China into a point of uh, a deeply adversarial relationship, what the Americans would call a competitive relationship as of the end of 2017, the trade war, new national security strategy, et cetera. So on the East Asian front, let me try and answer your question by saying this. Uh, I believe that a Biden administration will be as hard line as the Trump administration has been on China. Secondly, however, it will be systematic and not chaotic. Thirdly, it will carve out areas for collaboration within that hard line, particularly on climate, uh, particularly I think on global financial management and global pandemic management. I think the last thing to say though, 
uh, is that um, there'll be new areas of confrontation as well, namely on universal human rights. So in Asia, there'll be, I think, some recalibration. In Europe, I defer to your knowledge in terms of the Obama-Trump continuity. Uh, but um, uh, on the Biden question in terms of Europe, uh, he is intrinsically an Atlanticist. Um, uh, you know him. Mm. Uh, I know him to some extent. Uh, he has a big preoccupation with Russia, uh, which is very much in his DNA. Uh, he does yeah. not simply subscribe to the fact that China has replaced Russia as the principal US security threat. He sees both as security threats to the United States. And therefore, I believe um, he will seek to uh, rebuild the bridges bilaterally with the Germans and the French and with Brussels uh, and with NATO collectively uh, on the question of dealing with uh, the Russia challenge. Anyway, that's my view from this distance. I want to come back to, to China in a, in a minute because I know that you uh, have a special interest and expertise in that, uh, in that area. But I, I wanted to talk about COVID and the international response that there's been, which has been you know, hugely disappointing with the uh, sort of rise of nationalism and you know, sort of people looking inwards, uh, hardly any international cooperation at all. Do you, do you think that the multilateral institutions, the UN, the WHO, et cetera, are, are badly damaged as a consequence of this or will they learn some lessons from it? I think, George, you're right. The I mean, I did a review of the UN multilateral system in 2016. Um, one of the volumes of our 10 volume report was on how to prepare for the next pandemic, by the way. Um, you'll be pleased to know, perhaps not surprised, George, that all of its recommendations were ignored um, <laughs> <laughs> together with others, but such is the way of the world. Um, but I think it's, when we did that review in 2016, this was at the end of the Obama period, the institutions of global governance then uh, through the UN system uh, were beginning to be threadbare, to be honest. Um, UN Security Council, uh, a degree of uh, Russia, US, um, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Russia, uh, US um, stalemate uh, in the council. Uh, many countries walking around the council Security Council in terms of problem solving, uh, the UN, uh, other UN agencies uh, beginning to become less funded, less effective, um, uh, and less mission focused. The big standouts, however, being the UNFCCC, which did bring into bear into being the Paris Agreement on Climate Change in 2015, and the passage of the Sustainable Development Goals in the same year. So, but things were frankly becoming threadbare. However, with the American decision to walk away from so many institutions altogether, uh, resigning from the WHO, withdrawing from the UNFCCC and from the Paris Agreement, uh, effectively turning its back on the World Trade Organization, resigning and leaving the Human Rights Commission. You know, remember the UN, those of us as students of the history, George, is America's child. It's the San Francisco yes. Conference. I mean, they tidied up the world, you know, together with a few of the rest of us in 1945. So roll that forward to the present, add the COVID crisis, which was a remarkable opportunity for the multilateral machinery to come back into full force, but it needed a leader, I think in the United States um, to actually lead that charge. And what is remarkable, I think as a lesson for us all as we look at global institutions, on paper, they look fine. The functions are clear, the powers are clear, but to make them operationalize, as you know from your NATO experience, you need leaders to drive the machinery into reality. And that's where we've not had that global American leadership taking, frankly, the COVID crisis by the scruff of the neck through the G7, through the, G, uh, through the G20, and through the, um, the World Health Organization. We could have turned this world into a different place. Instead, we, as you said quite before, quite tragically, resorted to nativism and nationalism. Well, you know, the, the, the fact is that, you know, we are where we are and it's a mess um, and we're facing a global recession. Indeed, I think, you know, quite frankly, we've seen nothing yet uh, because we've still got to see the repercussions of, uh, 
uh, of, of the economic hit that has taken place, the huge levels of debt that countries are running up, and the fact that the developing world still hasn't had the full force of the of the pandemic itself as well. So, you know, it, do you think that the the international system has got the capability, uh, even with American leadership now, to, to, to save us from the worst uh, of uh, of what might be coming down the road? I think if Biden is elected, George, and this is not intended to be a partisan comment, you're from the British Labour Party, I'm from the Australian Labour Party and Biden's a US Democrat. So for fear that our Scottish friends think this is a global centre-left conspiracy, it's not. It's just that um, Biden happens to believe in the multilateral system. And so therefore, the question is, under his leadership, will the institutions function to manage the unfolding financial and economic crisis before us. Um, and you know, my recollection and experience of what happened uh, with the global financial crisis, uh, which was a cocktail of uh, Gordon Brown's leadership, um, uh, also of um, uh, Obama's leadership, and several of the, uh, several of the rest of us you know, in supporting roles driving the institutional machinery of the G20 in that London summit of March of 2009 to reach a, an outcome on financial and economic measures, which then, as it were, broke the fall, which had happened uh, precipitately across markets across the world. And that was markets looking in the eyeballs of the 20 largest economies in the world, led by a couple of leaders who knew what they were doing, saying, guess what? These guys have got their stuff together. Um, this, these measures make sense, and it actually restored market confidence. If you look at the curve back from March, April of 2009 to recovery, that's when it occurred from. This time round, if Biden is in the saddle, a lot of his team have experience from that period. They know the machinery that can work. Uh, they would fold fairly seamlessly into not just the Treasury, but, um, but also the G20 machinery and the rest. And here's the good news. Uh, and I'm fully mindful of uh, the dangers on the horizon here, George, because of, I'm on the advisory board of the managing director of the IMF, uh, Kristalina Georgieva. Um, the IMF, to give it its due so far, with a replenishment of its fund, has been able to forestall any sovereign crisis, despite the fact that we now have 70 to 80 governments in the world who have been to the fund for emergency interventions. And the fact that we don't have the Financial Times each day regaling uh, the world with, let's call it, uh, 200 Greece crises as we had, um, you know, five, seven years ago, uh, is because the IMF is actually doing its job. But what's the problem? The problem will lie with private debt and the private debt lying on the balance sheets of so many banks uh, at present. And what happens uh, when those uh, private banks are no longer able to sustain it on their balance sheets. Uh, fortunately, I think the IMF and the central monetary authorities are alert to the challenge, but we need American leadership to bring us through. So if Biden gets across the line, he may not have much time to get his um, feet under the table. Yeah, and I think we forget sometimes that even if Biden wins uh, next Wednesday, uh, Donald Trump is still the president or the until the 20th of January next year. And uh, that can be a fairly long period uh, in politics and uh, a lot of damage <laughs> could, could also be done. Can I, turn, can I turn to China? You know, this is the Asia Scotland Institute. You know, hmm. uh, China appears to have a grand strategy. Uh, the West doesn't seem to have any strategy and, and even its tactics don't seem to be right. So where, where is, is China going? Where is it taking us and, and what can we do about it? Let me try and, for the benefit of your audience, George, if, if they're interested in the China question, take, I'll take three or four minutes to try and encapsulate what I think Xi Jinping's grand strategy is, if that's useful. Mm. Um, cool. And it's, it's a number of points. And if, and if you're sitting in the Politburo, the Standing Committee of the Politburo in Beijing, what are your order of priorities and where do you want to take the place? Number one, keep the party in power. First priority always for a Leninist state. Number two, 
uh, unify the country, which means continue to suppress Xinjiang and do whatever you can to control Hong Kong and do whatever you can to get Taiwan back. Number three, continue to grow the economy so that you're raising living standards and per capita income to sustain your party legitimacy. Fundamental. And that's under challenge right now because of COVID, but also American uh, uh, countermeasures on the economy. Number four, environmental sustainability. Uh, China has basically grown rapidly for 30 years because there were no environmental constraints. As a result, they created some of the worst polluted cities in the world. Now there are environmental constraints because people don't like it. And even the Communist Party's waking up to that. Five, um, modernize the Chinese military, according to Xi Jinping, uh, so that by 2035, it is a global military power uh, and with a PLA capable of fighting and winning wars. And by mid-century, to be a global military great power. Um, and so, um, uh, number six, push the Americans back uh, from the West Pacific to what's called the second island chain. Uh, for our Scottish friends, if you look at the island of Japan, go and cast a line from Japan down to the Philippines. That's essentially the second island chain. Push the Americans back to Guam. Um, number seven, on the looking west, uh, use the Belt and Road Initiative to create um, a general sphere of Chinese influence across Eurasia, which will run into friction with the Russians, uh, but also to do that in a manner uh, which causes China's economic presence across Eurasia and therefore increasingly Europe and not just Asia, but Europe, Central Asia and Asia, where China becomes this irresistible center of economic gravity, pulling everything towards it and thereby compromising, or shall I say, causing countries to yield on foreign policy questions to China. And finally, number nine um, is in the rest of the world in the G77, uh, through development assistance, the BRI, trade investment, create a phalanx of uh, 100 votes to be called upon on any day of the week in any multilateral forum to vote for the Chinese candidate um, and to give trouble to anyone as a candidate who they don't approve of. And that leads us to the very concluding point remold the institutions of global governance in a direction where China, uh, which are much more accommodating of China's interests, and here's the rub, Chinese values. And so I see Roddy's back with us. I won't elaborate further, but that's their roadmap. When people say the Chinese don't have a grand strategy, uh, my Australian response to that is it's just bullshit. Um, they do. Um, and it's been clear for quite a long period of time. These are these are a lot of plates uh, for Xi Jinping to uh, to keep spinning at the same time, you know. And Gorbachev, in many ways, tried exactly the same in the in the Soviet Union, uh, and found mm. out that uh, the plates kept dropping essentially because the first plate, i.e., the uh, the dominance of the party, um, became subordinate to the economy. Xi Jinping appears, uh, does he not, uh, to have made, made the unity of the party, the dominance of the, of the Chinese Communist Party, the priority, does that not endanger some of the other plates that are spinning at the same time? That's a, that is a highly acute question, George. And the parallels with the CPSU experience are real. Here's the rub, though. Um, only the Chinese would do this. They submitted the collapse of the CPSU to a 10-year study between 1991 and 2001. I think the Chinese would do that. Um, and they had a deep analysis to how the hell did the, um, the mother of the revolution, uh, going back to the Bolsheviks in 1917, let the whole show go, both through the economy, loss yeah. of control of the middle class, etc. So the core dilemma for them is the polarities you spoke of, which is for the economy to continue to fire, um, you continue to need uh, market-based economic reforms domestically um, and competitive neutrality abroad. But right now, in order to, on the other side of that equation is preserving the centralist powers of a Leninist party and state. 
In other words, one decentralizing power economically, continuing to centralize power politically. So what's Xi Jinping's fix on this? His predecessors, Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, essentially allowed this to run its own course. And if you look carefully at their writings, there was always an opening that the political power of the Communist Party would over time evolve. Um, I won't say in the direction of liberal democracy. I won't even say in the direction of a Singaporean guided democracy, um, but in some, into a different form, a less authoritarian form. Xi Jinping's script is the reverse. Yeah. And if I look carefully at Xi Jinping's writings and at what he's done, uh, he's actually re-centralized power of the party, as you correctly said. But as a result, in the last three years, we've seen declining economic growth well before COVID mm. and well before the current global recession. So you are right to sound a tempering note. Um, Chinese communists think they can see their way through. They think they're smarter at economic management than the, when the Ruskies ever were. The jury will be out on that. Um, but they think they can also survive the external pressures coming their way as well. But the political economy question you point to, I believe, is central. I'm tempted to ask about Hong Kong because it's obviously of great interest here in the UK, but I, I worry much more about Taiwan and uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the possibility of a great power confrontation over Taiwan. Do you think that that is, that that is likely possible? Hmm. Yeah, um, I think if you, um, we normally focus in our part of the world on four sets of these sort of issues. Hong Kong, but sovereignty has been transferred to China. The Chinese regard Hong Kong as in the box. Uh, that is their box. And therefore the international heads of power for any military action against China over Hong Kong do not exist. Mm. That's the you know, bald faced reality. Doesn't mean that human rights offenses are any uh, less, but that's just the reality. South China Sea, reminds me a little bit of Dodge City 1860 with the sheriff not in town. That is, you know, people still contending for space and place, uh, reclaimed islands, freedom of navigation, etc. And so there's a real danger of metal on metal there and escalation. That is collisions in the air and collision at sea. Uh, and the worrying thing, George, is that the two militaries at present are not talking, US and mm. Chinese. The military channel has ossified in the last 12 months. So then we go to East China Sea with Japan, uh, always difficult, important to keep our eye on, but I think with enough rehearsal of the kabuki play between the two of them to know uh, where not to go in terms of fundamentally crossing each other's red lines there. And the Chinese know the operationalization of the US-Japan uh, defense treaty and US forces would come in to intervene. So it brings us back to your question of Taiwan. Uh, my big fear, to be frank, uh, George, is if Trump loses, what does he do in the interregnum uh, between now and the inauguration? Uh, um, fortunately, Pompeo has ruled out going there as Secretary of State because Pompeo is setting himself up as the China hawk in opposition against a Biden presidency for the next four years. Um, and um, I think even Pompeo judged that going to Taiwan may be a bridge too far. Pence going to Taiwan as vice president, unlikely, but it has been debated and discussed. A naval visit by the United States to a Taiwanese port, uh, fraught with danger. I think the compromise at present for the, uh, for the Trumps uh, would be to send the national security advisor to Taiwan, uh, which is a non-cabinet appointment, technically, um, but highly significant and symbolic. So the danger still of crossing this line is real. And the Trump administration, unlike the Biden administration, I think is much less sophisticated at understanding where in reality the red lines actually lie. So you're right to flag that as a genuine, I won't say um, Sarajevo possibility, um, but in terms of an incident, uh, escalating quickly, uh, it's fraught with danger. Yeah, no, I, I very much agree with that. I, I, I remember at the time of the, ha the handover 
uh, in Hong Kong. I'd had a lot to do with Hong Kong up until then, and I was looking forward as Defence Secretary to going out for the handover of the ceremony. I got a phone call from Chris Patton to say, please don't come. And I said, well, why not? You know, I'm quite looking forward to coming this important occasion. He said, well, he said, if you come, he said, the Chinese Defence Minister will come and he'll bring a couple of hundred thousand PLA troops with him. So stay away, please. You know, so I remember having to face the reality there. A couple of, a couple of questions before I, uh, I allow uh, the, the large assembled audience to, to ask some questions, Kevin. Well, one is about Brexit. <laughs> you, must, you must watch, be amused <laughs> as we go through the, the trials and tribulations of Brexit. You know, where, where, where do you think as an Australian? Because you know, the, the, the Prime Minister is talking about an Australian type deal coming in the next few, few weeks, which actually could be called the Afghanistan deal or the Ethiopia deal as well but you know what we'll, we'll give, give us a very brief account of what you think britain's future is uh, post brexit uh, I'll, I'll i'll seek now to be diplomatic george we're talking about uh, <laughs> our respective country i, th which... I think an, an australian diplomat is a contradiction <laughs> in terms that's right um we take that that commentary george is a badge of honor the, um, <laughs> uh, we uh known for calling a spade a shovel. Um, the bottom line is, um, look, uh, I thought uh, Brexit was madness. The simple reason is Britain is stronger in Europe and Europe is stronger with Britain in it, end of story. Um, and, uh, but Britain has voted, uh, or at least a proportion of it has. Um, so we therefore, we are where we are. Um, I cannot for the life of me understand how we can have an argument that if you put together, quote, the old Commonwealth of Britain, oh, sorry, of Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, that that somehow begins to add up to um, uh, a substitution for 350 million people just across the ditch from you uh, in, um, in uh, continental Europe. Now, there are 25 million of us, there are 5 million Kiwis, that's 30. Add 35 million um, uh, Canadians, that's 65. Well, so you've still got a country which is somewhat smaller than Germany uh, in terms of its aggregate size by putting three of us together, uh, leaving aside, you know, distance and all the rest of it. I mean, the critical question will be, uh, will you be able to negotiate an FTA with Biden? I mean, that for me is the, the real question for the United Kingdom. I mean... If I was Prime Minister of Australia now, I would do everything possible to do an FTA with Britain in its current circumstances. Why? Because we are pro-British. You know, we, we want Britain to succeed. We think what you've done over Brexit's nuts, but we want you to succeed. But the Prime Minister in me just says, for God's sake, the numbers don't add up unless you get the Americans. Uh, because the critical mass of 320 million Americans plus 60 million of the rest of us 65 million of the rest of us um, in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, you start to get closer to the um, economic bulk that becomes less available to you in terms of the new relationship with Europe, uh, deal or no deal. And I won't even enter into that debate at the moment in terms of uh, what uh, Prime Minister Johnson finally uh, arrives at with Brussels. Yeah, indeed. Well, I, I, I'm... I had a final question, which is um, the bravery of somebody who decides to take on the Murdoch Empire can't uh, be underestimated. But anyway, I'll leave that hanging in the air at them. Having seen some of the retaliation, I must say you, you need a thick skin to be able to, to take it. But then you've been in Australian politics long enough to have a, <laughs> a, a, a hide like a rhinoceros. Roddy, are you going to now Tell us who's asking yeah. questions. I, I, yes, I will. Um, and uh, but I would, I do hope someone will pick up on this issue of fake news and the power of the media, uh, and how certainly your view, as I see it, Kevin, is that it's got far too powerful within the Murdoch uh, Empire. But we'll perhaps we'll pick that up as we go along. But thank you both of you for a really interesting discussion so far. And now, Doug, if you'd like to be the the shepherd to. Uh, marshal the troops with their questions. 
Uh, Roddy, thank you. We have a, a series of questions. Um, I would ask all those people asking questions if you could keep them brief, of course, because we don't have that much time. Um, perhaps if I could go to Donald Fothergill, first of all, if you'd like to ask your question, please. Yes, um, good morning, everybody. And hello, George, and hello, Roddy. Um, I think um, uh, Kevin's summary of China's strategy in his seven or eight points, whatever they were, were absolutely spot on. And indeed, uh, the course of Chinese strategy, um, which is focused towards them becoming the world's primary superpower in the next 30 years or so, uh, has changed radically under Xi. And it's been well documented by people like Professor Anne-Marie Brady through to the recent book, um, Hidden Hand by Hamilton and Olberg, what, what, what's, what that strategy is and where it comes from. In relation to Australia and New Zealand, I'd quite like to ask a question of the former prime minister. Is there a difference in response to the PRC's ever increasing use of hard soft power as between the current administrations in Australia and New Zealand? It's a really good question. And it's a little difficult for me to answer directly because I'm no longer in government. I don't see what the intelligence community is telling us. And so uh, I'll, I'll have to make some generalizations. Um, uh, I think China's um, attitude towards uh, winning friends and influencing people around the world is, is not unique to Australia. We see it in most other countries. And essentially the strategy is fairly clear. One, the agency of the economy. China becomes your major economic partner. Two, over time, um, it becomes plain to you that um, if that relationship is to be grown further, then observing Chinese political sensitivities on questions such as Taiwan, Xinjiang and the rest need to be observed. Moving into phase three, which is as few broader foreign policy sensibilities and arrangements, in particular with the Americans, the more sotto voce they become, the better. This is a process of inference over time, but then becomes louder and if you've seen Donald with your own local examples in London of wolf warrior diplomacy, um, uh, in my own judgment, as someone who began life as an Australian diplomat, George's great contradiction in terms, um, the uh, uh, wolf warrior diplomacy uh, has been counterproductive. And the very interesting thing to observe in the last uh, six weeks, uh, since Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister's visit to Europe, um, about uh, sometime in August, September, I think, he found that the response there was uh, not welcoming. And so it began a process in Beijing of actually putting the wolf warriors back into their cave. Um, and as a result, you'll see a much more sotto voce approach again, I think tactically, not strategically from our Chinese friends, uh, whether that's in Canada, Australia or elsewhere. So, Underneath it all, though, uh, the question of economic leverage remains. Uh, and there's certainly uh, the case with the current Australian government, um, and there's a separate debate about the way in which Australian-China policy has been articulated and executed, which I won't bore you with. But um, certainly the economic leverage has been applied in the China-Australian relationship. Uh, but the Australian government, and I don't think the Australian Labor opposition, um, have... Um, yielded to that in any way. I think finally, I think what is uh, going to be uh, most challenging in the future will be what happens in the cyber domain. Um, we're all familiar with uh, how this operates. Um, and I think as China acquires huge capabilities in this domain, uh, I think we've only had the first taste of what this will all mean for the future. And so um, I might leave my comments there, Donald, to let others um, participate in the conversation. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we have a question from uh, Mark Allison. Mark, if you'd like to ask your question, please. Uh, thanks, Doug. Good morning, George and Kevin. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, one of Scotland's biggest exports and Australia's biggest exports has been its people. And following on from your comments on, around Brexit and trade, I wonder, Kevin, if you have any thoughts on the strategy the UK should follow in its bilateral negotiations with Australia, with the US and with the many European countries, especially around financial services and the movement of high qualified labour. 
Hmm. Let me take the easy part of that first, which is labor, and the hard part of it uh, second, which is financial services. Um, and far be it for me to provide advice to a foreign power about its negotiations with our own power, um, Australia, but I will anyway. Um, <laughs> the uh, uh, number one is, look, you know, Scotland's greatest strength and even the history of the British Empire has been, frankly, the, fo the fact that uh, you guys in Scotland became, you know, the, um, the arteries of, uh, of the uh, commercial domain and in part the military domain of Britain's presence around the world. And as a result, I think you imbibed into Scottish culture a deep uh, internationalism and international awareness, uh, which you don't necessarily equate with all parts of you know, the United Kingdom. I think there's something quite unique there. Um, secondly, therefore, I think uh, open labor exchange, by which I mean in all categories of the professions between our, our economies is good for both countries and removing all those visa constrictions and immigration restrictions in whichever direction, I think is essential uh, for us all. Uh, on financial services, uh, if I were the Brits, obviously given the residual strength of the city of London, uh, against other financial centres in the world, for which the rivals, I suppose, in Europe are still at Frankfurt, um, um, less so historically, prospectively, question mark, uh, given your exit uh, from um, the European Union. Hong Kong, now question mark because of country risk considerations. Uh, Singapore increasing, and Tokyo, I think, uh, to some extent, strengthening. I still think the city of London together with your universities, remain Britain's signature strengths and Scotland's signature strengths in the, in the world. So therefore, in the prosecution of the financial services agreements as part of financial uh, free trade arrangements with countries such as my own, uh, all I can say is um, to um, uh, maximize your negotiating hand, but not to the extent of denying a deal. I mean, look, all of our uh, family have all worked for each other's financial institutions at some stage or another. So I think removing any, um, uh, as I said before, any labor related imped impediments, but also service delivery impediments in this wonderful unfolding world and terrifying world of FinTech, the arbitrariness of geography will become less critical. And therefore the degree of expertise which you and the city can provide in quick, immediate, transparent, and probity-driven financial transactions and services around the world, the better. And it may just be that where you luck out or luck in, let me put it in those terms, that is where you, your luck may be in, is that if there are geopolitical problems in, um, uh, in, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, which uh, prevent its further rise, notwithstanding China's counter strategy, which you will see evidence at present uh, with the uh, the Alibaba, sorry, the uh, Ant Financial float uh, jointly done in Shanghai and Hong Kong, which will be probably bigger than um, Saudi Aramco in terms of its final market cap. I still think the city of London, for reasons of familiarity, transparency, the legal regime, uh, the excellence of the services, but also I hope its ability to fully embrace every new dimension of FinTech may set it in good stead, particularly if New York um, runs into structural difficulties. I'll leave my comments there. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a question from our own uh, Consul General in Edinburgh from Japan. Um, if you'd like to ask your question, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity and a great presentation by Prime Minister. Uh, six years ago, uh, when Prime Minister came to uh, Houston, Texas, I was consul general there and asked him a question. <laughs> so many Chinese students are studying in the United States. At some point in the future, do they bring change in Beijing? I think uh, Prime Minister's answer basically was, uh, we will see. And uh, mm -hmm. what will be your answer to the same question after six years, uh, since so many things have changed? Thank you. <laughs> And your question, Consul General, is about uh, the numbers of uh, Chinese students in America uh, or American students in China or both? Well, uh, basically, uh, Chinese students in America and also UK and Australia and everywhere. 
I, I thought that uh, they could bring a uh, democratic change. Are there any possibilities? Look, uh, I have a very simple view of these things, which is number one, the American stated concern about a large number of Chinese students is to do with um, intelligence and security. Um, uh, I have an old fashioned view that that's why we we spend a lot of money on our intelligence and security agencies so that they do a job. And that that should not get in the road of continuing to offer um, an opportunity for Chinese students to study in the United States. Not least because of the enormous upside um, and not just in economic and commercial terms, that is fees to American universities, fees to British universities, fees to Australian universities, et cetera. Um, it has to do also with the human bridges which are then made in commerce and industry later on. But let me tell you, when I live and work in Beijing, as I've done over the years, uh, firstly as a diplomat and back in multiple capacities, in the God, 150 times I've visited China in the last 35 years, you know, um, the bottom line is it's so easy to spot someone who's been trained uh, either in the UK or the US or Australia. Um, because what happens is the conceptual framework for analysis changes. Um, I mean, uh, Cartesian logic, um, uh, a, um, an attitude to management, um, and an, an attitude to uh, how you solve uh, complex uh, disagreements and problems. Um, is impacted on by having been educated in these systems. Now, it's not universally good, um, but let me tell you, whatever America believes it's losing uh, by having 300,000 Chinese students running around the United States, um, let me tell you, America is gaining a whole lot more in terms of the value added to American society, uh, to um, Silicon Valley, uh, to um, American GDP, and frankly, and to American soft power within China itself. And the same applies to you Brits, well, not you, Consul General, um, uh, and to uh, the Australians. In my case, Australia, for example, in a normal season, there are about uh, 300,000 Chinese students in America. There are about 160,000 in Australia, okay? We have more in Australia than you have in the UK because of geography and et cetera. Um, and I'd be very sad if these numbers just fell through the floor because I think it would be bad for both countries and bad for the kids, that's my view. Kevin, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we have a question from William Knight. I'm going to try and get a couple of questions in uh, whilst we still have a little bit of time. So, William, if you'd like to ask your question, please. My question, my question relates to the quad countries, of which Australia, of course, is one. Would you uh, wish and see the chances of UK becoming also a, a member of it? And the other relates question relates to the TTE, T, the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, whether UK should become a member, member of that as well answer if you like um, Doug. On uh, TTIP, I'm a huge supporter. I'm a huge supporter of TPP, tra uh, the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership and TTIP, the Atlantic equivalent. Here's the challenge for the Bidenistas if they win. The Biden administration, the Democrats may run around the world and say, hey, we're in. We're not Trump. Be happy and be relaxed. Tick. Um, point two, uh, we're re rebuilding our alliances. Tick. Three, we want a combined strategy uh, to uh, confront the Chinese at every level, question mark from the rest of us. Why? Because the Americans are asking us to um, basically jeopardize our economic interests against our security interests and our human rights interests. What's a logical response from the, if you were the Americans? A bit like what their forebears did in 45, which is to begin incrementally opening the American economy to the rest of the world. So the rest of the world had a huge market in America. And uh, that's gone down the gurgle in the last several years. So Biden's really difficult challenge is to rekindle 
uh, TTIP and TPP uh, in one form or another, uh, so that uh, the size of the North American economy, uh, the NAFTA economy becomes accessible to the Europeans, the British, um, and frankly, to their democratic Asian allies as well. On the quad, I defer to the heads of the MOD and to George Robertson, who knows where all the bodies are buried. But I have noticed the two new flat tops, and I think they're quite impressive. They came, they came out of my defence review in 1998, you know, so I'm still very proud of them. Oh, you should be. Hey, by the way, George, I commissioned two flat tops here, not as big as you, but two helicopter carriers. And right. prior to those, and prior to those, we had uh, the fleet air arm in Australia disappear. Uh, so uh, we now have uh, two, I think, 35,000, 40,000 tonners, uh, which are quite handy in the immediate region in the Southwest Pacific and Southeast Asia. Yep, very visible. Doug. Thank you. We, we have lots of other questions, but I think we're running short of time, um, just uh, coming up to the hour now. So I, I was planning to... Uh, hand over to Roddy, um, perhaps just to, to summarise and finish. Unless, George, you wanted any, to ask any further questions. No, I think, I think we're, we're running out of time as well, but I think it's been fascinating uh, you know, to, uh, to hear your view, uh, uh, Kevin, on, the, on these areas. There's an awful lot going on in the world today, and we've only touched on, on a little bit of that, you know, what's going to happen with India, what's going to happen to the whole Indian Indo-Pacific region as well. We'll, mm. we'll have a big bearing on the uh, the kind of foreign policy that uh, this country should be developing post-Brexit. Mm. So yeah, you've enlightened us a lot, Kevin, as usual, and uh, uh, we look forward to cogitating on what you've said. <laughs> well, thanks for having me, uh, George and Roddy and uh, Doug and to all of our friends in Scotland. Uh, when I got an invitation to speak to you guys, it's basically just an instinctive emotional response, which is I like the place, so, so happy to do it. <laughs> so, uh, well, we're, we're very uh, grateful to you, and I'm glad you had that instinctive response. And I think that everybody on this call uh, probably realizes that we've heard some extraordinarily sensible, wise comments in the analysis of what's going on viewed from where both of you are sitting. But the good news is that we've been recording it, so it'll be up on YouTube for those who haven't been able to join us this morning. Uh, or this evening, your time, uh, uh, Kevin. And uh, I'm quite sure that if there are other pressing questions, Doug will be able to send them to you, Kevin, and you, or, or George, and you might perhaps be able to answer some of them. But uh, thank you very much on behalf of the Asia Scotland Institute. George, from where you are, for, for guiding the questions. Kevin, for fielding them like uh, a very able batsman and knocking some of them for six for sure. And you've given us a lot to think about uh, during the coming week. And who knows where we shall be uh, as November moves into December. So on behalf of the Asia Scotland Institute, Kevin, thank you a great deal. And George, thank you also for having led us today. And Doug for organising it. Thank you, everybody. And good